If you have a Bible tonight, turn, if you will, to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. When you stop and think about it, uh, there are a lot of Bible characters that we've read about over the years that if we were honest tonight, we'd have to admit that we don't remember much about them. I don't know how many of you are in the habit of reading all the way through your Bible. How many of you do that? Maybe you're on a Bible reading schedule and uh, you read all the way from Genesis to Revelation. And uh, we read a lot in our Bibles in a year's time that many of the Bible characters we don't remember. We, we've heard about them at one time. We've read about them as we, for instance, have read this story here in 2 Kings chapter 5. But many times we don't remember them. And the reason being is because they are not what we would call uh, the main Bible characters. Uh, there's not a ton of verses maybe dedicated uh, to them, and therefore we hurriedly read over their names and forget all about them. They, they somewhat fly what I would call under the radar, obscure, and sometimes even wrongly labeled as insignificant people. They are behind the scenes. They are unnoticed. Their names forgotten, and yet from God's standpoint, very important people in the scheme of his overall plan. For instance, do you remember two men named Bezalel and Ahoyliab? How many of you remember those two? All right, all right, there's somebody back there. I'm not real sure. Are they honest and raising their hands? Um, <clears throat> my guess is that probably most of you do not, but they are a classic example of what I'm talking about here tonight. You say, who are they? Well, according to Exodus chapter 31, they were the lead craftsmen who were called by God to construct the original tabernacle. Now, when you stop and think about it, that's a pretty significant job that God gave them, right? The construction of the original tabernacle. And yet, as I ask for a show of hands, the vast majority of us don't remember their names. We don't remember anything about them. And yet, most of the times when we think about the book of Exodus, we think of two main characters, Moses and Aaron, right? Maybe if we really, really think hard when we think of the, the book of Exodus, we might come up with Jethro and maybe Miriam, right? Okay, now we've come up with four. But chances are we would never think of names like Bezalel or Ahoyliab. We would never think of those people as being important Bible characters in the book of Exodus. Now, not all the forgotten men and women of the Bible are known for good character traits. Some of them are known for bad character traits. And such is the case with the person that we are looking at tonight in this message. His name is Gehazi. How many of you have heard of Gehazi? All right, some more hands are going up. And he goes down in Bible history for his greed. As a matter of fact, um, the verses I'm going to read in just a moment, uh, 2 Kings chapter 5, I'm going to read verse 20 and verse 27 and in just a moment. But in my Bible, and I've got a reference Bible, right above verse 20, there's the heading, Gehazi's Greed. That's what it says, Gehazi's greed. Now, Gehazi was a servant to the prophet Elisha. And by all accounts, he seemed to be very faithful when he first got started serving the Lord. But somewhere along the way, Gehazi became infected with the disease of greed. And if there's one place greed does not need to exist, it's in the ministry. And that's what Gehazi was involved in. He was involved in the ministry, the ministry of the prophet Elisha. When you think about greed and you think about ministry, uh, the two of them are like trying to mix oil and water. Why? Well, because ministry is all about others, right? And greed is all about what? Self. So the two don't mix together at all. A person in ministry is required to have a high standard of conduct and a high standard of, of uh, character. But a greedy person will compromise his character and will do the unthinkable just to get what he wants. And that's what you're going to see tonight in this servant's 
uh, life here that we read about named Gehazi. Generally speaking, greed will manifest itself in four main areas of life. I want to talk about this before we jump into the text and we study the story that we have here in 2 Kings chapter 5. But greed will manifest itself in four main areas of life. Now, I'm going to get real practical here because I believe that probably all of us to some degree struggle with this. Number one, first there is the area of money money. Now when greed and money, when we talk about those two subjects together, greed is where we are consumed with having what? More money. Uh, we never quite have enough money. We're always greedy to have more money. So consumed that we will do anything to make more money even at the expense of relationships and even personal integrity. I've seen people like that in life where they will compromise their character and they will do things that are unimaginable simply because they are greedy to have more money. You've probably seen those types of people as well. God forbid that we would be one of those types of people. Amen. As God's people, we should never be driven by greed, but rather as we will see tonight, we are to be content with what God has given to us. Number two, there's the area of possessions. Greed is not only where we are consumed to have more money, but greed is where we are never satisfied with what we have and we are driven to have more and more and more things. Our American culture is consumed with having more stuff, right? We have so much stuff that we can't get into our closets. We have so much stuff that from the closets it goes into the what? Garage to where we can't even park the cars in the garage anymore because we have so much stuff. America is so consumed with stuff that we even have now where you can rent storage space for all the stuff that you don't have room for in your house, right? We are consumed with stuff, having more and more. We must not forget the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. That's not what life is all about, is what Jesus is saying. Contrary to what uh, we get exposed to in American culture, life is not about accumulating stuff. It's not. If you get driven by that and that gets a hold of you and controls you year after year after year, you'll waste your whole life pursuing after stuff, temporal stuff that will not last. So we must be more passionate about laying up our treasure where? In heaven than we are to lay up our treasure here on earth. Thirdly, there's the area of fame. So there's the greed that we have when it comes to money, the greed that uh, we have come, when it comes to possessions and stuff, and then there's the greed that we have in the area of fame. Now, this is ultimately all about being greedy for attention. It's the desire to be recognized. It's the desire to be known, to be quoted, to be seen, to be popular, and to be sought after. Those who are consumed with fame find themselves using people and using opportunities as nothing more than stepping stones to the next level. Again, have you ever met somebody like that? You felt like they were just using you as a stepping stone. They were just trying to get where they wanted and you really didn't matter. They would just literally throw your relationship to the wind because what was more important to them was money, possessions, and fame. And then there's the fourth area that we see greed in, and that is the area of pleasure. A natural byproduct of an affluent culture like we have in America is what we call hedonism. Now, don't let that big word scare you. I want to talk about that just for a second, all right? Hedonism. As a matter of fact, the word hedonism comes from an ancient Greek word that simply means pleasure. Pleasure. Hedonism is the unbridled pursuit of satisfying our sensual desires. A hedonistic person is all about his own 
personal happiness and what makes him feel good. It's all about me, me, me when it comes to a hedonistic person. You see, we live in a very humanistic culture. Would you not agree? God is not at the center of our culture, but rather we are. Mankind has placed himself as the center of culture, and he does whatever makes him happy. Is that really the way we are supposed to live our lives? Or are we supposed to be living our lives with God as the center of our life? And it's not about what makes me happy. It's about what makes God happy. See, there's a different uh, perspective that we as Christians ought to have about this. But mark it down. When it comes to envy, covetousness, and greed, they are enemies to those who want to serve the Lord. Now, before you think that I'm just addressing those that are involved in full-time Christian ministry, I think that all of us as Christians ought to have a desire to serve the Lord, right? We ought to desire to do something to make our lives count for Christ. Well, I want to caution you when it comes to serving the Lord, we must be careful uh, that we don't get uh, falling into the trap of envy and covetousness and greed. Now, let's look at our story here of Gehazi, uh, Gehazi rather, found in 2 Kings chapter 5. Now, this story actually is a continuation of a story of a man named Naaman. Now, how many of you remember Naaman? We all remember Naaman, don't we? You just couldn't remember Gehazi. <laughs> but Naaman uh, is a story that we remember from our Sunday school days. He was the captain of the Syrian army who had leprosy. He had heard through a young slave girl that had been captured from Israel that there was a man of God that could heal him from his leprosy. To make a long story short, Naaman makes the journey to the land of Israel. Well, the prophet Elisha gives Naaman what seems to be an odd treatment for leprosy. Imagine if you went to a, a doctor and they gave you this kind of a, a treatment. He was to go and to dip himself in the Jordan River seven times, right? You remember the old song that we learned, and he dipped, and he dipped, and he dipped, he dipped, he dipped. You remember that in Sunday school? Don't act like you don't remember that, all right? I remember having to sing that song as a child. But he was told to go to the Jordan River and to dip himself seven times. At first, the idea seemed to be so ludicrous to name it. He began to argue with Elisha, and he got angry with Elisha. But finally, his servants persuade him to give it a try. They said, hey, we came all the way here. <laughs> you might as well try it and see what happens. Well, when he emerged from the waters of the river, his leprosy was completely gone. He's so excited that he goes back to Elisha because in his mind, he thought, you know what? I need to pay Elisha some large sum of money for the healing that I just received. Look at verse 15 and 16. 2 Kings 5, beginning in verse 15. And he returned to the man of God, he and all of his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore, I pray thee, Take a blessing of thy servant. Now, what was he saying? I've got a gift for you. <laughs> I've got a gift for you. I want to give you something for the healing that you gave to me. Now, look at verse 16. But he said, that is, Elisha said, As the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it. Naaman was just insisting that Elisha take this gift, this blessing that he wanted to give to him. But it says that Elisha, what? Refused. Now, just in case uh, you think that Naaman was trying to slip Elisha a $20 bill or a $100 bill, uh, I want you to think again. Look back at verse 5. And the king of Syria said, and he's talking to Naaman, and he says, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold, 
in ten changes of raiment. Now, for those who have done the math, all right, and I'm not smart enough to do the math, but I am smart enough to do the research. So I was able to research and to find out that this was about 750 pounds of silver and 150 pounds of gold. That was not slipping him a $20 bill or a $100 bill to say, hey, thanks for the healing today. This would be worth more than a million dollars in our day and time. Plus, notice also 10 brand new outfits. I wonder what those outfits were like. 10 brand new outfits. Think about it. Because Elisha would have been set for life, right? I would have think that some of our health and wealth and prosperity gospel preachers would say, let me come on back to my office and we'll take care of this transaction really quickly here and get you on your way. But Elisha was not that kind of man. And Elisha refused to take any of it. And that day, Naaman discovered that God's grace could not be bought. Right? God's grace could not be earned. It could not be bought. God's grace was free to all who will simply believe and receive it that's what he learned he finally just had to believe he had to go to the Jordan River and he uh, dipped down into the Jordan River seven times he believed and then he received the healing of his leprosy and he couldn't pay for it he couldn't buy it he couldn't earn it it was free it was God's gift to him and I think Elisha knew that if he accepted that that bribe if he accepted that present that blessing that gift that Naaman would always wonder about God's grace. And so Elisha refused it. It would be a great, great story if it ended there. But it doesn't end there. I said all that to get to my text. Look, if you will, at 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning in verse 20, and follow along in your Bible. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master has spared Naaman, this Syrian, in not receiving at his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. So Gehazi followed after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, is all well and he said all is well my master has sent me saying behold even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets give them I pray thee a talent of silver and two changes of garments and Naaman said be content take two talents and he urged him and bound two talents of silver and two bags with two changes of garments and laid them upon two of his servants and they bear them before him and when he came to the tower he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house and he let the men go and they departed but he went in and stood before his master and Elisha said unto him whence comest thou Gehazi and he said thy servant went no whither. Now that may be a little confusing when you read that, but basically he's saying, uh, I'm not up to anything. <laughs> I didn't go anywhere. What are you talking about? <laughs> Verse 26, and he said unto him, went not mine heart with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants what all do you want Gehazi what will make you content what will make you happy and then you see that horrible horrible curse in verse 27 the leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever and he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow Gehazi had been right there all along prior to verse 20 he had been right there behind the scenes uh, 
waiting to be told what needs to be done by his master Elisha. But all along, he was watching and he was listening to the conversation that was going back and forth between Naaman and Elisha. He couldn't believe his ears whenever his master Elisha had refused to take anything from the, the hand of Naaman. And in verse 20, I want you to really look at verse 20 and digest what he is saying in verse 20 because he begins to rationalize in his mind why the money should not be refused. Notice verse 20 again. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master hath spared Naaman this Syrian in not receiving at his hands that which he brought, but as the Lord liveth, notice he injects God into this situation, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. Now, as you and I read this story, we know that Gehazi was overcome with the sin of greed. Greed and covetousness, envy. But if you carefully read verse 20, again, you will see that he so rationalized what was going on in his mind and he rationalized why the money should be received and why that was actually God's will for them to have that money. As he watched Naaman's caravan with 10 talents of silver and 6,000 pieces of gold and 10 brand new outfits disappear over the horizon, the wheels in his mind begin to churn. He can't believe that his master, Elisha, had just turned all of that down. And in a moment, he creatively justified in his mind and made something that was wrong into something that is right. You ever been around somebody like that? That can somehow twist and make something which is wrong into something which is right. And he mentally gave himself permission to do something that would be labeled inappropriate. Oh, he wouldn't ask for all the gift, right? That's the way he justified it in his mind. Naaman had offered to his master Elisha, what? He had offered him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 pieces of gold, and 10 brand new outfits. So what did Gehazi ask for? Well, he asked for just one talent of silver and two brand new outfits. He pretended like he wanted the talent of silver and the two new outfits for two other prophets, two preachers that were coming to visit Elisha. And uh, in reality, it wasn't for them at all. It was for who? Gehazi, right? Greed is always thinking not of others, but always thinking about self. Again, I remind you that this is an important story that teaches us of how we need to be careful about greed and covetousness and envy creeping into our hearts and into our lives. Gehazi wasn't thinking about the good of Naaman. He wasn't thinking about the good of Elisha. He wasn't thinking about spiritually what was at stake here. No, Gehazi was only thinking about himself. And he wasn't thinking about anybody else. By the way, one sin always leads to another sin, right? I grew up with my mom telling me that. My mom quoted me verse after verse after verse. Uh, as a young boy, until this day, many of those uh, verses uh, stick with me. But uh, one of the verses that she kept pounding into my head was the one found in the book of Numbers, be sure your sin will find you out. And oh, she would pound that into my head constant. She must have known I needed it, right? And uh, we find out that one sin leads to another sin. And that's why we see Gehazi first lying to Naaman. He's lying about the two prophets coming to visit. There wasn't two prophets coming to, to visit Elisha. And then he later lies to his master Elisha. Oh, I've been somewhere. I haven't been anywhere. What, what are you talking about? He's lying again. Long story short, God had already revealed to Elisha what Gehazi had done. Exposed and embarrassed, he would now be condemned to live a life with leprosy. Can you imagine? He now had the very disease that Naaman had been healed from. 
Gehazi had wanted Naaman's money. He had wanted Naaman's apparel that he had brought. But instead what he got was Naaman's leprosy. And if that wasn't bad enough, look at verse 27 again. His descendants was also would be cursed with leprosy. The leprosy thereof, Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. Sometimes we forget that our actions will affect not only us personally, but will affect our children and our grandchildren to the next generation. And that's what we see with Gehazi. I believe that Proverbs chapter 15, verse 27, could be written over the life of Gehazi. And it says this, He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts shall live. We've got to be careful that we don't live a life of greed. We don't live a life of wanting what somebody else has. We don't live a life where we're never content with what we have. You see, Gehazi goes down in history, I believe, goes down in history as the Judas Iscariot of the Old Testament. You say, why do you say that? Well, he loved money more than he really loved the Lord. Judas did the unthinkable for 30 pieces of silver. Do you remember that? And then now we see Gehazi did the unthinkable for one talent of silver. Gehazi fell into the same temptation that Ananias did in Acts chapter 5. He was so overcome with greed that he lied to cover up his sin. Greed gave birth to one sin after another. I want to give you a few practical lessons and then we're going to close tonight, all right? Some practical lessons for all of us from this story here in 2 Kings chapter 5. Number one, we should serve God not for financial gain or recognition, but simply out of love for Him and obedience to Him. This is why we ought to serve God. Amen? We should be willing to serve God expecting nothing in return. Nothing. As a matter of fact, we should serve Him because of who He is. He's the God of the universe. He's the God who created us. He's the God who redeemed us with his, the precious blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. And so we ought to have a desire to serve Him because of who He is and what He has already done in our lives. God owes us nothing. Do you understand that? Sometimes uh, the whole health and wealth and prosperity gospel preachers uh, make us think that, that God owes us something and that God just exists in order to make us happy all the time. Nothing could be further from the truth. As a matter of fact, God doesn't need you to exist, but you need Him to exist. And life is not all about you, it's all about God and serving God. So God owes us nothing, but we owe God everything. Everything. What we deserve is eternity in hell. That's what we deserve. But God saved our wretched souls, and we owe Him everything. Till the day we die, we owe Him our last breath. So we ought to serve the Lord, not for recognition, not for finances, not to get a pat on the back, not to get our reward down here, but to receive our reward up there, right? We want to serve Him because we love Him. We want to serve Him so we can be obedient to Him. Watch your motives for serving the Lord. Gehazi had the wrong motive for being Elisha's assistant. Number two, we should be content with what the Lord gives us and always trust him to meet our needs. When Gehazi got back to his house, he probably thought to himself, I'll never have to worry about money again. That's probably what he thought. He said, you know what? This has been a great day. I asked for one talent of silver. He gave me two talents of silver. I got two brand new outfits out of this deal. And he thought, I'm set. I am set. Again, that may not sound like much to you to say two talents of silver, but that was 150 pounds of silver that he brought back home. That's a lot. Instead of trusting God, Gehazi would now depend on what he had gotten from Naaman. 
The Bible tells us that godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. We are to be content instead of always wanting more and never being happy with what we have. We are to be content with what God has given us and He wants us to not trust ourselves for tomorrow but to trust Him, to simply trust Him to meet our needs. Last thought, sometimes it's a bad thing to get what we want. <laughs> you ever thought about that? Sometimes it is a bad thing to get what we want. I may be reading into this passage a little bit, but you observe this, please, with me in verse 27. But the Bible doesn't say anything about the two talents of silver or the two brand new outfits being taken away from Gehazi. Elisha doesn't say, give it back. He doesn't say that. It seems like he kept it. Gehazi got what he wanted. 150 pounds of silver and yet that could not buy him healing from the leprosy that he had did he not connect the dots did he did he not remember that Naaman had just tried to to buy healing and Elisha said no it's God's grace it's a gift from God to you because you believed and you've obeyed the command of the Lord now what does he have? He has 150 pounds of silver, Gehazi does, and he's got those two, uh, two brand new outfits. But wearing two brand new outfits with leprosy, you can't hardly strut through the town with that, right? Where is he going to show off these outfits? He's got leprosy. He would now have to, as he approached people or came, come near the town, he would have to cry out, unclean, unclean. He would live a life of isolation. All because of greed. Watch out what you want in life because God may just give it to you. Gehazi is a powerful illustration of how devastating greed can be to a person's life. He's one of probably what I would call one of the forgotten characters. But he is a forgotten character that we dare not forget. <laughs> you better remember the story of Gehazi. Remember what greed got him. Oh yeah, he got the two talents of silver. Oh yeah, he got the two brand new outfits. But he also got leprosy, instantaneous. The very moment, he says, before he went out of the presence of Elisha, he was as white as snow, came all over his skin. And then the curse upon his children and his children's children. There's always a lesson behind every Bible story and every Bible character. I want to encourage you to read the Bible with open eyes and open heart. And you'll find that even somebody as obscure as Gehazi, somebody that we would not say we remember much of, there's a story there. There's a lesson there to learn. And the lesson is beware of greed.